John Gotti and Al Capone might be the two most famous mobsters of the 20th century. But if you were going to make a list of the top three, then you would need to include Albert Anastasia. Called the Mad Hatter behind his back because of a resemblance to the character from Disney's Alice in Wonderland movie, Anastasia had the temperament that made him a ruthless gangster able to dominate the underworld while at the same time being ill-suited to be the top boss of a large criminal organization. It's believed that for two decades, he was the underboss of what would later become known as the Gambino crime family. In 1931, when he was appointed to that position, the organization was led by boss Vincent Mangiano, with the family then taking his name. Anastasia would succeed Mangiano in leadership, but it would not be a peaceful transfer of power. The Mad Hatter is perhaps the most prolific of killers in the Mafia. And when he decided that being second in command of the family was not enough for him anymore, he eliminated his boss in an efficiently hostile takeover. Here is the story of how the first family boss in the modern Mafia era was murdered by his underling. But before we begin, I just want to remind you that if you enjoy this video, please like it, comment, and subscribe. Much has been written and documented about Albert Anastasia due to the infamy he achieved during his lifetime that made him a household name along with his face becoming the image that the public had for a ruthless hoodlum during the 1940s and 50s. Hundreds of pages of FBI intel on the man are available for download on the Bureau's website along with many articles that the newspapers from his era wrote about him. He was thrust into the public spotlight after Abraham Kid Twist Rells from Murder Inc. was arrested and told investigators everything he knew about the murder squad, Anastasia ran. Typically, one of the advantages of an organized criminal organization is that the leader gives an order and an underling carries it out. This separation creates a legal protection for the leader as he could deny his involvement if the underling is caught. And Anastasia was not the typical mafia leader. Sometimes he would join his crew on a hit and he would be the one to carry out the act in front of his men, like stabbing a person in the ear with an ice pick. Some say that the Mad Hatter enjoyed the act of killing, and that's probably true, but it's also a case of a boss leading by example. It could have also been a subtle warning to those working under Anastasia that if they crossed or disappointed him, they would be next. Mangiano was the opposite of his underboss, because he knew how to stay in the shadows. He had been arrested before, and his name was well known on the Brooklyn waterfront, where he dominated his racket of corruption. But it appears that after 1928, he did not have any legal problems. And while his name has been mentioned in newspaper articles about violence on the waterfront, the FBI did not have any files on him during his lifetime. Vincenzo Mangiano was most likely born in December of 1887 or March of 1888 in Palermo, Sicily. He first immigrated to the United States in 1905 with his sister and settled in Brooklyn where he listed his occupation as a gardener. Once settled in his new country, he Americanized his name to Vincent. Over the next few years, he would travel back and forth across the Atlantic as he brought more relatives with him. He also returned to Sicily to marry his wife, Carolina, and bring her back to the States where they would have four children during the 1910s, two boys and two girls. During the 1910s and possibly earlier, Mangiano became involved with the local mafia in Brooklyn and would become part of Salvatore di Aquila's family. In 1920, he became a naturalized U.S. citizen and applied for a passport so that he could go on a planned trip to Italy with the written reason being to settle his estate there. At this point, he now listed his legitimate occupation as being a merchant. It's thought now that the reason for his frequent back and forth trips was to serve as an emissary between the growing New York-centered mafia and the mother country that spawned it. Not much is known about his early career because the old-timer mafiosi were pretty good at keeping their oath of omerta. In October of 1928, boss Salvatore di Aquila was shot on the street and killed. Tensions were boiling among the various mafia factions across America, and in December of that year, a meeting was held in Cleveland, Ohio at the Statler Hotel among the leadership from all the families in the nation to try and de-escalate the growing hostilities. 
Manjano was photographed at that meeting as a representative for his family, which meant that he must have at least been a powerful capo by this point, if he wasn't in the upper management yet. Al Mineo took over as boss of the family after this, with Steve Ferrigno as his number two. During the Castella Marise War, they allied with Joe the Boss Masseria. Both Mineo and Ferrigno were killed in an ambush during the fighting, and leadership of the family reverted to Bronx-based capo Frank Scalise. It's been rumored that initial war victor, Salvatore Maranzano, wanted Scalise to kill Mangiano, but Scalise delayed, and after Maranzano's untimely death, the hit was called off. If you want to learn more about the Castilla Marise War, then please check out our video on the subject. Now, the murder of the family's leadership, along with the defection from Masseria to Maranzano, split the family, with some choosing to remain on the side of Joe the Boss. When Lucky Luciano succeeded the dead Maranzano as New York's most powerful mobster, he chose to create the commission to govern the underworld, rather than have one man be the boss of bosses who would eventually be violently murdered by the next ambitious man, with the cycle of chaos continuing. Luciano is then said to have reorganized the Mafia, with soldiers from different crews being put into completely different families to create a balance of power. It's also claimed that he forced Frank Scalise out of the boss position of what was the Mineo family, and he installed Vincent Mangiano in his place. The Capos agreed to this change of leadership because they did not want to antagonize the powerful Luciano. But the family at this stage was not yet complete, because Albert Anastasia had a crucial role to play in its final formation during 1931. Albert Anastasia was not Sicilian. He was from Calabria, which the Sicilians considered to be another country, despite all of them being Italians. He grew up poor, and as soon as he got the chance, he left his village by finding work as a deckhand on a departing ship. When the ship arrived in Brooklyn, he went on shore leave and never returned. On that day in 1919, he committed his first crime in America, illegal immigration. He found work as a longshoreman, and in 1921, he murdered his co-worker, George Torino. He was sentenced to the electric chair at Sing Sing State Prison. As he went up the river and waited for his date with death, he was an aggressive inmate and always got in the fights. This caught the attention of another prisoner, who was friends with the then rising gangster, Charles Luciano. Seeing that he could use someone as tough and ruthless as Anastasia, Luciano used his political connections to get a judge to rule that Anastasia's conviction was invalid and another trial was needed. Four witnesses disappeared before the second trial and Anastasia was acquitted due to lack of evidence. During the 1920s, he became close with Luciano and was a dependable call to make when something violent needed to get done. But his sole occupation during this time was not being a hitman. He formed his own gang of Calabrians on the Brooklyn waterfront to extort the laborers and shipping companies. We don't know when Manjano and Anastasia first met, or even became aware of each other, but it was most likely during this time and they must have been competitors. Anastasia's star rose during the Castella Marise War, and it's rumored he took part in the hit against Giuseppe Morello and was one of the four gunmen to take out Joe the Boss. During those two years, he became close with the leadership corps that was forming around Luciano. While the Castella Marise War began as a conflict between two Sicilian-born gangsters in their fight to dominate the American underworld, it ended as a battle between the young and older generations. The older generation did not want to work with anyone that was not Sicilian, while the younger one was open to a little diversity to expand their operation and profits. When the young prevailed, the Mafia was now open to all Italians, not just the Sicilians anymore. And as the leadership of a decent-sized Calibrian gang, with connections to the mob's new top leadership, Anastasia became a very powerful man. We're not sure of the exact details of how it went down, but because of their mutual interest in the docks, Mangiano and Anastasia struck a deal. They would consolidate their gangs in the one family. Vincent would be the boss, and Albert would be his number two. Any other waterfront gangs that didn't join or quit were to be murdered by Anastasia. After a few holdouts were killed, their control on the waterfront was absolute. The partnership would last for 20 years, but maybe because this was the Mafia, where codes of honor were just hollow words repeated as lies for men to get what they wanted, 
its foundation would never be solid. And by the time the 1950s rolled around, tensions were rising in the Mangiano crime family that threatened to tear it apart. Vincent Mangiano, boss of what would become the Gambino family, was written about in the newspapers of the time, and he was given the nickname, The Executioner. There can be little doubt that this name was earned because of his position as boss of the violent mobsters who enforced the corruption at the Brooklyn waterfront and its surrounding neighborhoods. If the mafia of the old timers era liked to call themselves men of honor, the reality was far from that. Instead, they were parasites who used violence and the threat of it to extort both workers and companies, which drove up the cost of everything to everyone, while making a select few men very rich. For the dock workers, once they became part of the International Longshoremen's Association, they needed to kick back a significant portion of their daily wages to the Mangiano family in order to keep their jobs. For the companies, if they had cargo that was time sensitive to unload, then they would need to pay bribes to the mobsters who controlled the workers, or else the cargo was not going to be moved anywhere. And the top off on how much the mafia controlled the area? Dock workers were only allowed to shop at mob-approved stores, even if the prices were high, because the mobsters got a kickback from there as well. But this power arrangement started to become disrupted in the late 30s, and it was not because a rival gang was trying to move in. Instead, a longshore man named Pete Panto started speaking up and holding meetings to protest the current conditions. Emil Camrata, a possible family member and vice president of the ILA, summoned Panto to a meeting at his office to warn him to stop what he was saying because some of the boys did not like it. By some of the boys, he meant the Mangiano family. Panto ignored the warning and kept on speaking up. On Friday, July 14, 1939, he was preparing for a date with his fiancée, when someone knocked on the door to his apartment to tell him that he had a phone call. He left, took the call, and told another person that he was about to meet some people he did not trust, and if he was not seen in the morning, then they should call the police. Camarda was in the car that picked up Panto and drove him out to a farm in New Jersey for a meeting. When he arrived, he found Albert Anastasia and hitman Mendy Weiss waiting for him. Panto tried to run away as soon as he realized what was about to happen, but he did not get far. He was strangled to death by Weiss and was then buried with quicklime to dissolve his body. In the aftermath of his disappearance, it became common to see graffiti in Brooklyn that said, Where is Panto? Mangiano's territory was not just the docks, though, and the waterfront was not his only racket. His crime family was also involved in gambling. They would have bookies plus illegal casinos for the public to use, and they did not tolerate any competition. Irving Feinstein found this out the hard way. He was a degenerate gambler who would make bets on if the next person to walk around the corner was smoking a cigarette or not. He would even host his own gambling parties in the Borough Park neighborhood of Brooklyn. When Mangiano learned about this, he summoned his underboss and declared that Feinstein needs to go. Anastasia stalked the target and discovered that every Monday, he traveled to Brownsville to pay off a loan shark he owed money to. Anastasia assigned the hit to Jewish gangsters Abe Rells, Pittsburgh Phil, and Bugsy Goldstein. The plan was to kidnap Feinstein off the street in a stolen car and then bring him to Rells' house where they would kill him in the basement. When they approached Feinstein on his way to his loan shark, he assumed that this was just a misunderstanding about the money he owed and he went with them because he did not have much of a choice. He probably figured that the guy he owed money to would not kill him because then he wouldn't be able to collect his payments anymore. When they arrived at Rells' house, the hardened killer was shocked to find his wife and mother at home when they were supposed to be out. He gave his wife some money to leave, but his elderly mother was not going anywhere as she was in her bedroom sleeping. Feinstein was muscled into the house, and it started to dawn on him that these guys did not abduct him because of the money he owed. He tried to run, so Pittsburgh Phil put him in a chokehold. Feinstein then somehow bit his arm, which angered the ruthless killer. Phil and Goldstein gave Feinstein a vicious beating, while Rells grabbed a rope, made a noose, and struggled to loop it around the fighting man's neck. Pittsburgh Phil was an expert with knots, and he created a rig where the more Feinstein struggled, the tighter his noose became. 
In a way, he strangled himself to death. They took Feinstein's body from the house and put it in the trunk of the stolen car. They then drove to a vacant lot in Flatlands, doused the car in gasoline, and let it burn. No one seemed to notice the massive fire, and it eventually died out. A subway ticket taker named Louise Maurer discovered the crime scene on her way home from work. When the police arrived, some of the toughest street cops vomited after viewing the horrific scene. Mangiano might have not actively taken part in the hit, but he ordered it. He spent his days in Red Hook, Brooklyn, headquartered at the Democrats Club. While the name sounded political, it was a mafia social club where the money from illicit activities was used to fund local elections for politicians that Mangiano could then keep in his pockets. His weekends were spent on Long Island, where his wife and kids lived. Saturdays and Sundays would be full of family-friendly activities, but when Monday rolled around, he was back in Brooklyn, presiding over his empire of violence. The only other thing we know about Mangiano's personality was that he enjoyed cooking, and would often prepare meals for his crew and the commission when they held meetings. According to Joe Bonanno in his memoirs, Mangiano acted as the chairman for the commission and he is credited with creating the phrase Cosa Nostra, our thing. During the period of the 1930s and 40s, Albert Anastasia's activities are better documented thanks to the exposure to the public of what would become known as Murder Incorporated. The origin theory to the group's formation was that Luciano and the original commission did not want their soldiers to be directly committing murder. The goal was to keep the mafia in the shadows from the public so they could operate without scrutiny. But because violence was needed to maintain effective enforcement, it was decided to outsource the task to Jewish gangsters, with Anastasia acting as the middleman between them and the commission. The arrangement planted the seeds of conflict between boss and underboss, as the bosses from other families were bypassing Mangiano to contact Anastasia when they needed violence, causing Mangiano's ego to become offended. One of the first tests for this new murder squad arrangement came when prosecutor Thomas Dewey went after Jewish gangster Dutch Schultz. Schultz wanted to kill him and went to the commission for permission. Anastasia stalked Dewey at his home, apparently pushing an empty baby carriage as his cover. Anastasia learned the man's routine and saw that every morning Dewey left his house and used a public payphone to make business calls. This was a time when it was uncommon for private homes to have the luxury of their own telephone. He felt that they could easily kill Dewey as he walked from his house every morning. The commission voted against murdering the prosecutor out of fear that the retribution of law enforcement would be worse than any trouble Dewey was already causing. Mangiano is said to be one of the members who persuaded the others to this view. Who knows if the cancelling of Anastasia's plans caused resentment for the underboss. The details of Murder Inc. would be a topic for another video. The brief summary is that for a period of almost a decade, a group of Jewish gangsters spent their time hanging out in the back of a Brooklyn candy shop that was open 24-7. When a piece of work needed to be done, Anastasia would assign the available gangsters a contract and people would die. It is estimated that Murder, Inc. might have killed up to a thousand people during their prime. Law enforcement only became aware of the scale of the group when Abe Rells was arrested and told the police everything he knew. The revelation of Murder, Inc. and the National Crime Syndicate that they did work for shocked government authorities. Jewish gangsters that were named by Rells were arrested. Newspapers sensationalized the trials, and as each member went down, the DA wanted to go after whom he claimed to be the leader of the organization, Albert Anastasia. Anastasia was well known to the local authorities, but after the revelation of Murder, Inc., he instantly became famous with the public. Overnight, he became America's most notorious hoodlum since Al Capone. But despite all the publicity, prosecutors were never able to bring a case against the Mangiano family underboss. On November 12, 1941, while under police guard at a Coney Island hotel, Abe Riles fell out of his window without any cops noticing. 
The official story is that he tied two sheets together and tried to escape his protection. If that was true, then those two sheets were definitely not long enough to bring him halfway between the ground and his room. Rels died before he could publicly testify in court against Anastasia. As with Albert's other brushes with the law, the lack of witnesses made the case against him fall apart and he was able to walk away free. During the high publicity of Murder Inc.'s revelations, newspapers started calling Anastasia the Lord High Executioner. It was a name meant to mock instead of praise, but this newfound celebrity was everything the Mafia did not want. Overnight, their most effective killer turned from an asset into a liability. One question I have about Murder, Inc.'s collapse is why didn't the commission, or at least Mangiano, have Anastasia killed? If Albert had brought Rels into the group, then wasn't he liable for the man becoming a stool pigeon? Or worse, Anastasia knew where all of the Mafia skeletons were because he put them there. With law enforcement eager to bring him down, wasn't there a danger that he might talk under the right amount of pressure? The Mafia had killed a lot more people for a lot less reasons. Well, for starters, we don't know if the commission did not consider taking him out. In hindsight, Mangiano might have lived longer if he did. And he had the right to, since Albert was part of his family, and what he did in his family was his own business. But he also would have started a civil war if he tried it. The Mafia is like a feudal kingdom, where a boss's power is not absolute. It's created by the crew captains who pledge their loyalty. And if you alienate enough capos, then your days at the top are over. The Mangiano family of the 1940s is said to have had three factions within it. The first and smallest were the hardcore Mangiano supporters. This included Vincent's brother Philip, who was believed to have either been a powerful captain or the family's consigliere. Another faction, which was the largest, were the Sicilians, who were loyal to the structure of the family, but probably did not have any extra love for Vincent Mangiano personally. This group included Frank Scalise, who also might have been either the consigliere or a very powerful capo since he was briefly the boss. But the Calabrians were the second largest faction and they were loyal to Anastasia. Future underboss Aniello Della Croce was part of this group. If their leader was murdered and they rebelled, then the family would be permanently split in two. Anastasia was brought into the Mafia by Lucky Luciano, and he had great relations with the most powerful men in organized crime, along with Luciano's underboss, Frank Costello. Maybe these men knew that Anastasia would never rat because of their mutual past. Whatever the decision-making process was, Anastasia was safe and kept his prominent position. Details about Mangiano's life become especially sparse during the 1940s. He is mentioned briefly in Mafia Turncoat Joe Volacci's unpublished memoirs that can be found online in a positive light when Mangiano lent the down on his luck Luciano family soldier a car to use. Volacci's memoirs also describe a dispute Volacci had with the Gambino brothers, where Frank Scalise intervened. This makes me speculate that Scalise might have been part of the upper management. Anastasia's life during this period is far better documented. Abe Rells' unnatural death occurred on November 12, 1941. With the district attorney's lead witness dead, the initial case they had against the Mad Hatter needed to be re-strategized. Then, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, everything changed. The United States was now at war with Japan and Germany, and the New York waterfront, controlled by Anastasia and the Mangiano family, became vital to the national security. That winter, the SS Normandy, a French ship, was being converted into a troop carrier for the American Navy on a Manhattan pier. On February 9th, 1942, a fire broke out, which soon became uncontrollable. The ship capsized and was considered a loss, with one person dying. An official investigation ruled 
the fires caused to be accidental and not sabotage. But the rumor was that the accident was ordered by Anastasia to send a reminder to the government of who really controlled the piers. Although it was meant to cause only minor damage and the vast destruction was unintentional. Following this incident, a deal was brokered between the government and the mafia through Meyer Lansky for the mob to guard the docks in exchange for the eventual release of Lucky Luciano from prison at the end of the war. Meanwhile, the patriotic spirit of his adopted country seemed to have infected the Mangiano family's underboss, and he enlisted in the army. He was made a sergeant and served the United States by training army recruits how to load and unload boats. Following the end of his service term, he applied for and was granted American citizenship. The vilified Mangiano family was now protecting the docks they once exploited. And with the federal government now the largest customer, there was no way they could shake them down, so they had to turn to other illicit ways to make money. One well-known rumor is that Carlo Gambino, then a captain in the family he would later run and rename, made a fortune selling counterfeit ration cards. When America entered its post-war period, Luciano was deported to Italy, and the Mangiano's family's rackets returned to their old model of exploiting the hardworking men of the Brooklyn waterfront. And with Albert Anastasia no longer a necessary evil, law enforcement resumed their quest to take him down. Luciano was still technically the boss of his family, but now with an ocean separating him from it, Frank Costello assumed management in his steed. The next events, while taking place in another family, would have a direct impact on the future of the Manjanos. When Luciano was first sent to prison in 1936, Vito Genovese became the acting boss. However, in 1934, Genovese was involved in the murder of a fellow mobster because he owed the man $35,000 and did not want to pay him. In 1937, it appeared that the Manhattan District Attorney had a strong case against him, so Genovese fled to Italy to avoid being charged. He funneled money to Mussolini's fascist party in order to be allowed to stay in Naples. In his absence, Frank Costello assumed the duties of acting boss. When the Allies invaded Italy in 1943, Genovese switched sides and offered his services to the Allies. In 1944, he was arrested for stealing supplies from the US Army and then selling them on the black market. Once he was in custody, a background check revealed that he was wanted in New York for a 1934 murder, and he was sent back home across the Atlantic to face these charges. Ernest Rupolo was either an associate or a soldier of the Luciano family, and he was with Genovese when the 1934 murder occurred. When he was arrested for another killing, he gave up Genovese. Two other witnesses, Jerry Esposito and Peter Latempa, were also involved in the murder, and they corroborated Rupolo's statements. When Genovese arrived back on American territory in 1945, he was arraigned for the murder and pled not guilty. The following year, Esposito would be found shot to death on a New Jersey roadside, while La Tempa was found dead in a prison cell where he had been held in protective custody. Without anyone to confirm Rupolo's statements, the charges against Genovese were dropped. And now that he was back in New York, his goal was to reassume the power that he once held. This meant that Frank Costello was an obstacle in his way. According to Joe Bonanno in his memoirs, the late 1940s was a period of high tension between Mangiano and Anastasia. The men would get into arguments that sometimes would become physical and needed to be broken up. Mangiano was now in his 60s, while Anastasia was in his 40s. There was a generation gap between them, and a lot of the younger members of the family favored the Mad Hatter. One growing source of tension between the two was the close relationship that Anastasia had with Frank Costello. The two would often communicate and collaborate directly, cutting Mangiano out of the communications and making him feel both offended and distrustful. Bonanno wrote that during this time, Mangiano seemed to be stressed and tried to confide in him, but Bonanno deflected as he did not want to get involved in another family's business. For Mangiano, 
Anastasia's ambitions were starting to become a threat to his power. While for Anastasia, Manjano's position at the top of the hierarchy was turning into an annoying obstacle. The current arrangement of power could no longer go on. When the Mafia Commission was created in 1931, a series of rules were implemented to keep organized crime well organized. One of these rules was that a boss could not be murdered without the approval of the commission. Otherwise, there would be constant power struggles in the families that would bring chaos with them. Likewise, if a boss wanted to murder a member of another family, then he needed to secure permission of that family's boss. However, a boss could have members of his own family whacked because that was his own house to keep. As the 1950s came, Frank Costello was feeling the pressure from Vito Genovese, while Mangiano and Anastasia were not getting along. It's believed that Costello felt that his position as de facto boss would be more secure if he had stronger allies on the commission. Vincent Mangiano was too old-fashioned for him, but Albert Anastasia was his friend, and he had a fearsome reputation as a killer that few would dare cross. They decided to make a secret deal if something were to happen to Mangiano, then Costello would throw his support behind Anastasia, becoming the family's new boss. It might also be true that at the same time, Mangiano took out a contract on his underboss. But this could be a made-up lie that was used to justify what happened next. On April 19, 1951, Philip Mangiano, Vincent's brother and chief enforcer, was out shopping with his wife in Brooklyn when he told her that he was going to get a cup of coffee. While he was away from her, someone approached him saying that he was needed. He walked away with that person and was never seen alive again. His body was discovered in a marsh, with his suit jacket and pants missing. He had been shot three times, once in the neck, twice in each cheek. His face was too disfigured to have an open casket funeral, and the body was identified by a tag in the shirt that had his name written on it. When the police came to inform Vincent about his brother's death, they could not find him. No one knew where he was. It was assumed that he was hiding out after finding out about his brother's murder, but this was a false hope, as he was never heard from again. In his book, Lord High Executioner, Frank Di Matteo claimed that his mobster uncle, who was part of Anastasia's crew, was there when Mangiano was murdered. He claimed that the Mad Hatter did not order the hit. Instead, he did it himself. The claim is that Mangiano was lured into a warehouse by Anastasia on the belief that he'd be collecting money from his underboss. As he smiled to greet him, Anastasia took out a gun and shot the old man so he could personally see what his reaction to his death would be. Mangiano was then gutted to the point where he looked like a mummy, encased in concrete and dumped into the ocean. Other rumors claim that Mangiano was lured to a house in Long Island for a meeting, where he was killed, or that he was kidnapped off the street and killed. Either way, his body was never found, and his biological real family had him legally declared dead in 1961. It's said that the legal work was done by Vincent Mangiano Jr., who became a lawyer rather than follow his father and uncle into the mob. The person who benefited the most from Mangiano's disappearance and presumed death was Albert Anastasia, and both law enforcement and the underworld figured he was behind it. Sure, he could not kill a boss, but how could a murder be proved when there is not a body? Mangiano's disappearance gave Anastasia plausible deniability. Plus, the murder of Philip eliminated the only person who could seriously rival the Mad Hatter's power in the family, while also sending a message to any other potential challengers. Anastasia was summoned to the commission to explain the disappearance of his boss. According to Joe Bonanno, he never admitted his guilt, while also claiming it was Mangiano who was trying to have him killed. Costello backed this claim, and because no one wanted to challenge the violent Anastasia, his statements were accepted, and he was named the new boss of the family, which then took on his name. But while Anastasia's passion for violence drove him to rise to the top, his temperament was not suited for the number one position. In the second half of 1951, 
There was a case against a group of crooked New York cops that were in the mob's pocket. Anastasia and Luciano family capo Willie Moretti were supposed to pay off the chief witness to stop him from testifying. Instead, they skimmed most of the bribe for themselves and the plan backfired. While the other families were angry at him, Anastasia spent a couple months holed up in his mansion compound so that he could avoid any attempts of retaliation. During this period, he managed to shift the blame for the snafu onto Willie Moretti. On October 4th, Moretti was gunned down in a restaurant. In February of 1942, Arnold Schuster, a clothing salesman with no connection to organized crime, was walking home when he noticed a famous and most wanted bank robber, Willie Sutton, walking down the street. He immediately told the police and Sutton was arrested. Schuster became famous overnight for being a good citizen, but one person was very angry at him for what he did. Albert Anastasia saw the news report and said, I don't like squealers. He then took out a contract on the man. On March 8th, Schuster was gunned down outside of his home. The story of Anastasia ordering the murder came from Joe Valachi. In 1955, the government successfully sent Anastasia to prison. It was a one-year sentence for tax evasion. One of the witnesses at his trial was a contractor who worked on his massive mansion in Fort Lee, New Jersey. After his trial, the contractor and his wife disappeared. The only evidence for what could have happened was blood spatter found in their house. When Anastasia was back on the streets, the government tried to revoke his citizenship for lying on his application about his criminal record. The ultimate goal was to deport the man, but a judge shot the strategy down. The upper management for the rebranded Anastasia family at this point had Albert at the top with Carlo Gambino as his underboss and Frank Scalise as the consigliere. During this time, the commission decided to open the books. One of the rules following the end of the castella Marise War was that all of the family's official memberships would remain fixed. The only way for new members to join was for old ones to die. But the commission had final say on when this would happen. A rumor broke out that Scalise was selling memberships to associates for $30,000. Anastasia might have also been in on it, but once the word broke out, he placed all blame on Scalise. The old man needed to go, and on June 17th, he was gunned down in broad daylight on a crowded Bronx street as he was buying fruit. This event would later inspire a scene in the movie The Godfather. Although he didn't realize it, Scalise's death was the beginning of the end for Albert. While Vincent Mangiano enjoyed a 20-year reign before his demise, his murderer and successor would barely last for six. Anastasia was whacked in one of the Mafia's most famous hits, when he was murdered in a barber shop at the Park Sheraton Hotel in Manhattan as he lay down for a shave with Capo Vincent Squalante. Four gunmen entered the place while Albert was vulnerable and they unloaded a volley into him. And just like how anyone would expect based on how he lived, the man was a fighter to the end. He meant to charge at his attackers, but instead he leapt at their reflections in the mirror before dying. Scolante was not killed and ran away from the scene as fast as he could. He would later be killed in the purges of the aftermath, when the family's leadership transitioned to Carlo Gambino. There are two main theories of why Anastasia was killed. In the Luciano family, Vito Genovese made a move against Frank Costello with an assassination attempt that narrowly missed blowing his head off. But Costello decided that his best move was to retire rather than fight back, which gave Genovese control of the family that now bears his name. Some say that Genovese, who did not like Anastasia and saw him as an adversary because of his relationship with Costello, conspired with the rest of the commission to take the Mad Hatter out. Anastasia was extremely dangerous, broke the rules, and his recklessness had the potential to destroy Cosa Nostra. Under this theory, Joe Gallo and his crew in the Provacci family were the ones who did the killing. The second theory is that he was killed by a trio of capos in his own family who felt that Anastasia was about to have them murdered for some infraction. The hit against the boss was then made as a preemptive act of self-defense, similar to the logic Albert used with the commission 
to justify the danger Mangiano presented to him. Vincent Mangiano and Albert Anastasia were both gangsters, and although they were both very different in style, they formed a partnership of convenience that lasted for two decades. In life, their differences became more apparent, and it climaxed in Mangiano's murder. But in death, they managed to find more in common. The rules for the Mafia state that a boss should not be killed without the commission's approval, as it carries a lot of risk for destabilization. When Mangiano was murdered without permission, all of the commission members compromised the rule for their own personal benefits. The same could be said for Anastasia. If his death was approved, it was because he became a risk to everyone. And if he was killed by internal members of his family, the commission was okay with that too, because the man was a lot of trouble. Joe Bonanno called his autobiography a man of honor and honor was a value that the Mafia claimed to cherish in the early days. But when these claims are made, it's best to remember the ancient proverb of, there is no honor among thieves. <laughs>